Linux attempts to create liberty within mismatched law, culture, and reality. Point one. It takes human society multiple generations to assimilate new technology. It takes us a long time to really understand and adapt to something. First, we adopt a new technology and experience its good and bad. The survivors create cultural expectations and the first experiments with law and punishment. It takes a generation or two of refinement before reality, law, and culture start to match. The speed of technological assimilation can be quite fast when the legal system is flexible and there are no blocking economic factors. For example, U.S. culture and law assimilated the telephone in only about 70 or 80 years. But when there is inflexible law or blocking economic factors, assimilation takes a lot longer. For example, U.S. culture and law has been working to assimilate the technology of cannabis for hundreds of years. As of 2018, the U.S. appears to have assimilated the technology of canned goods. After a hundred years, we're still working to fully understand all the consequences of automobiles. After 65 years, we're still decades from merging reality, culture, and law for photocopy machines. And after 20 years, U.S. law and the internet barely acknowledge each other. In the meantime, those of us with computers or the internet have to work with mismatched culture and law. Point two, the internet is as disruptive as a schmoo. For most of human existence, there has been little need or ability to control copies. Highly valued and skilled practitioners would support themselves by their craft, and their work tended to support existing economic systems. But technology has rewritten the rules of production and distribution first with the printing press, and then with the factories and mass communications, and then the digitization of almost everything, and now the distributed copying machine that we call the internet. Each has changed the nature and cost of goods. For example, it is as easy to share this video with everybody as it is to send it to just one remote person. Everybody engages in global speech all the time. This digital speech is about the same size and complexity as any other digital good. It all looks the same. When we share it, are we sharing speech, ideas, or property? Does that question matter anymore? Our new reality is contrary to the basic assumptions that underlie our legal traditions of speech and property. So now we wonder, who will pay the piper? What are the new responsibilities? What is the reasonable way to use and pay for goods? The answers are not easy. We're still evolving vocabulary, expectations, and law to deal with our new reality. Failing to understand reality has never been an impediment to politics. 
Human history abounds with the tragedy of political fantasy. The modern effects of our confused legal system are both laughable and tragic. Currently, our legal system attempts to control every copy, no matter how trivial. This implicates every use of computers and the internet. Point three, building an island of freedom in a legal quagmire. In the 1980s, a young programmer at MIT realized that the freedoms he cherished were threatened. Richard M. Stallman argues, as computers spread, access to programming determines if your computer serves you or somebody else. So computers would either enable or enslave men. Back in the 1980s, people laughed at the idea that our lives might be controlled by computers. Nobody is laughing now. RMS talked it over with his friends and came out with a short list of four essential programming freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to study how a program works and change it so that it does your computing as you wish. Access to the source code is a precondition for Freedom 1. Freedom 2 is the freedom to distribute copies so you can help your neighbor. And finally, Freedom 3 is the freedom to distribute source copies of your modified versions to others. Freedom 3 extends your freedom to others. These four programming freedoms appear to be essential to the future liberty of any technological society. But our confused legal system seems to be hell-bent on ensuring enslavement. Eventually, RMS figured out an elegant way to use the legal system against itself and create a sanctuary for programming freedom. He called it the GPL distribution license. By default, copyright law says, all programming is copyrighted. Copying software is a legally controlled activity. Nobody has permission to copy, share, or alter a copyrighted work. The creator has some rights and may work with the law to extend, extend some permissions to others. The GPL license takes this and twists it up into a knot. The GPL says, why yes, this programming is copyrighted. You may not copy, share, or alter this work unless you meet my conditions. My conditions are, you can use my program any way you like. You can copy my program as much as you want, as long as you preserve the GPL license and the four programming freedoms. If you distribute copies of anything that is based on my program, you have to use the GPL license and extend the four programming freedoms to others. At first, GPL software was a small, isolated thing. But RMS, Linus, and thousands of others have spent their lives adding to its value. The GPL can be contagious. As more and more programmers use the GPL, the scope of GPL software explodes. Every bit of GPL software adds value and influence to the GPL freedom movement. And as it grows, it sustains the possibility of liberty. Modern Linux distributions are one of the most visible artifacts of the GPL movement. <laughs>